Okay, I think we'll probably start going here. Um, looks like there's still people trickling in, but we might as well get going. Should be an interruption as they join. So, so hello everyone. Welcome to the presentation tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike McGinnis with Hockey Alberta. Uh, I'll be moderating most of these presentations for the next couple of weeks for our, our spring sessions. Um, tonight we're delivering this presentation in webinar format. So in order to keep it the presentation flowing and not get bogged down and respect Daryl's time. Let's just uh, put the questions in the question box and we'll, we'll kind of come back to them towards the end of the presentation, just to be respectful of time. And so for tonight, very excited to, for tonight's presentation. We've identified a disconnect on this specific topic. Uh, the goal for tonight is just mainly to start a dialogue. I know this, this hits a lot of different angles, uh, whether it's parents, coaches, associations, evaluators, it's kind of it's a topic for everybody. So we just hope that this dialogue will spill over into associations and, and possibly start some dialogue and, and just force change, maybe move the dial a little bit and so we can be better across the province. Uh, so in hopes of achieving this goal, we have highly respected guest speaker who uh, has assisted in some of the NHL's top players and their journey through minor hockey to the pros. Uh, in his recent book, Strategies to Teach the World the Best Athlete, he shares personal experiences about players like Patrick Kane, Nathan Horton, John Tavares, and also observations on players who, who maybe didn't make it to the big times. And that's really kind of what we're talking about tonight is some of those separating, separating factors that, that just bring players either to the next level or keep them, keep them held back and don't let them evolve. So um, uh, Daryl's also... Current roles are player development consultant with the Toronto Maple Leafs of the NHL and the Muskegon Lumberjacks of the USHL and also runs his own uh, highly regarded player development business, which you see up there, Belfry Hockey. Uh, so our presenter has been a, a major influencer in hockey over the last 15 years. Uh, he's created clarity from confusion for a generation of hockey people, myself included. Uh, I know years ago, I wasn't sure about the hockey coaching thing and I started seeing Daryl's YouTube videos and, and um, you know, it was one of the things that really helped me find clarity in the game, the way my mind works. So uh, I'm sure most of the people that listen to him find the same thing. So we're really excited to have, have Daryl here tonight. So let's welcome him and go ahead, Daryl. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks. I oh, can everybody hear me properly? I had some feedback. Is it better now? Can you hear me properly? Okay, so, um, when I first was presented with this topic, I didn't really know exactly what the context necessarily was. I guess I got a sense of what it might be. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm not necessarily gonna speak from a minor hockey perspective. I'm just gonna speak mostly from a player development perspective because that's what I know. And um, I think that the dynamics that go on as it relates to evaluating players um, at the minor hockey level, is incredibly difficult and um and then when you factor in the consequence of evaluation and what that looks like it feels like in player development then you're really talking about a fairly big animal that has a lot of different aspects to it and sensitivities to it so for me i'm just going to stick to the aspect of how evaluation and player development coexist or what what one lends itself to the other from my perspective and the way I view it is um, whenever you're evaluating a player to like make a team or you're evaluating a, to, to decide whether a player should uh, you know should advance to whatever that the next level is of the of the situation or then you're now you've decided that you want the player in your organization because they check all the boxes that you, or check a lot of the boxes that you, you want. Um, well, now you're, you're entering into player development. And so the, to me, the space, the space between evaluation of a player and player development is a plan, an idea of what it is that you want to do with them. And that's where it gets a little, a little dicey because um, everyone views the game differently. And so um, what I know for certain is that there's conflicts between evaluation and player development. One of the biggest conflicts that we have is good is relative. It's very, it's a relative comparison. 
amongst uh, the group. Uh, so among the people that we are evaluating, that's what we're that's what we're assessing. And so a good. So if I was rating a player between one and five, a player could get a four relative to the group, but not be a two in like another group. So if we took that pool and made it bigger, said, okay, in this small town of, you know, 2000 people, uh, this kid is a four, like he's a speedster, he's everywhere and he's faster than everybody else we have. And so this kid's elite, but then you take him and then you say, well, listen, let's take him as it relates to the whole league. Well, now it's, he's not as good. He's not as impressive. Um, so we got to always remember that your evaluation for the most part is comparison. The other part of it that's really important is it's very relative um, to the evaluator's experience as well. What does the evaluator know about these, about these things? So how much experience does the evaluator have in that age group? Do they know what good looks like? Do they know what the best kid in Alberta looks like at that age group or what the best kids have looked like in Alberta in that age group over a historical period of time. Because that context is really important as it relates to evaluation. How good is he or she? How good are they? And, um, and, and what does that look like relative to what we're trying to do now and relative to where we would like this player to go? So I find that one of the biggest conflicts is just understanding that good is good is relative. And there's two parts of relativity, the comparison of the player, your the pool of players you're comparing them to, and then the actual evaluators ability to assess based on their own experience of that age group and, and those players. So that's an important thing to understand. The next one is, um, Evaluation by pretty much by definition is I'm assessing where this player's current state is. But development has to do with what's going to happen in the future. It's a, it's a projection of where we want to take them. So already we're in conflict. This is who they who we think that they are currently, but then development is like pie in the sky. It's like if if it's if, maybe, when, possibly. It's all these adjectives that are that indicate, you know, a certain number of things have to happen for this thing to work out. And there's a high probability that we're going to try to do some things and it's not going to work out. So development's a real crapshoot. Like, but evaluation, because you have all the factors are in front of you, the pool of players you're evaluating are in front of you, the player is playing in front of you, and the current state is, is much more absolute, but that doesn't necessarily mean the evaluation is absolute. That's just the current state as of today, February you know, 16th, that's how good he is now, but you know, come May or June or July or next year, the whole situation could be very different. So that's another thing that I think is a conflict. The other thing is evaluation is largely about performance obstacles. So, you know, when I'm evaluating a player, I'm looking at what they do well, but I'm also looking at, you know, what they also, what they don't do well. So what are the obstacles, particularly, you know, the higher the player is in the evaluation process, the more I'm more favorably viewing what it is that they do and the less I'm really taking a look at the things that they don't do because they're above the curve. The more closer I get to the curve of like whether they're going to make the team or not make the team, now it comes down to the holes, uh, the obstacles, the problems. Like what's what are these and how, what are what, what am I as an evaluator looking to willing to uh, willing to accept and what are the one things that what are the things I'm not willing to accept and that can be based on my own personal bias. So I might be somebody that I'm like, listen, I prefer defensemen who can really skate. And I don't have an, as much of an appreciation or, or a preference for a bigger physical, more rangy type defenseman. If the defenseman can't skate, for me, that could be that could be a problem. So that impacts how I evaluate. So my personal bias weighs into the curve when it gets to the curve. The kids, there's a lot of kids that are above the curve and way below the curve. Then it doesn't really matter because the, well, these kids are going to make the team because they're frankly, they're just better than everybody else. And so we don't need to worry about them. 
in terms of evaluation. You're going to evaluate them, but it's not really the same. And their holes are relative, like I said before. So that's, it's very different. But when you get to the curve of which kids are actually going to, you know, the, on the uh, kid could make it or not make it, oftentimes it comes down to uh, the obstacles, the obvious holes that they have, and then my own personal bias. So that's a really important factor. And it's a real problem, I think, with evaluation because a group of evaluators, and that's why it's important to have a group, is because a group has a better chance of sifting through my biases and your biases and be able to come up with more of a common way in which we can, uh, we can have a vision for what it is that we're looking for. But development is about opportunity. So evaluation is holes and development is about what's going to happen. Like if he comes here and plays on this team, well, there's an opportunity here for X, Y, and Z to occur because, you know, we are all into development. So of course, there's going to be an opportunity to get better. So these are all things I think that are really important. So evaluation is comparative. So it's a, a group and development is personal. So that's another, I think, a real conflict. So I think before you even start a lot of these things, I think it's really important that you acknowledge as what this actually is and what's the difference and what are some of the challenges and conflicts between evaluation and development. So I think that that's really important, but ultimately it's a plan. So let's just take a look at tactical acceleration. So everyone wants people to skate well. So what we know for sure is, uh, especially for forwards, crossover skating is more valuable and more projectable than straight lines, straight, straight stride skating. However, straight stride skating can have some fundamental properties to it. So it's not like it's something where you say, okay, we're only going to teach crossovers. We're not going to teach stride because the stride itself and the properties inside the stride can make crossovers much more projectable. The more solid the posture is of the player, the balance, their edge control, their ability uh, to use the joints in order, all those factors are all the same factors that are going to make them important in crossover. So even though straight line skating, straight stride skating has limitations in terms of its overall use as the time goes on and crossover skating really starts to dominate uh, players skating um, projection, um, we can't ignore um, strides, straight stride skating because there's some properties that are important. So as you go through the evaluation process and as you're trying to come up with a plan for some of these players, you know, sometimes taking a look at these uh, as to the sliding scale, which is what I'm talking about here. There's a scale here that slides and it's important to, to pay attention to that. Speed change is much more valuable than relentless work. So you take a kid who's just like F1 all day long, sprinting all over the ice. The best part about that kid is that they work incredibly hard. The worst part about them is that they tend to play at the same speed. They play at maximum speed and they're at the same speed for long durations of time in a game, which is problematic. It's not as projectable as someone who has speed change, but that doesn't mean someone who has speed change is a, is a kid that's not working. They could be just very efficient. They're very efficient with their skating. They have great, excellent glide. Maybe they use their head more in terms of anticipation. They're very smart with their positioning. They have good sticks. They're able to put themselves in spots. They can read plays in advance. And so they don't need to be sprinting around uh, like a maniac uh, at the same speed. They could get themselves into good spots, slide in and out of spots. And then when it's time to skate fast, they're able to accelerate at a fast rate and utilize speed change. So that's important. Speed differential is more valuable than stretch speed. Stretch speed is valuable but speed differential is more valuable. Uh, so that's another, that's another factor. Um, so what is a speed differential? Well, it's trying to find situations in which you are speeding up and the person that you're playing against is slowing down or you're slowing down while someone else is speeding up. Those differentials create spatial opportunities for you 
that can be really advantageous. And the whole game is a game of speed and space and timing. And so speed differential can be a huge weapon. Stretch speed, while really important, has limitations. It has limitations of the passer's got to get you the puck at the right time. You're also skating directly into the defenders. Defenders have a better chance of matching your speed and your gap. But it can be harder to generate um, and be of any real value um, other than a decoy uh, or an opportunity if you could slip in behind the defenseman. But that's that has some uh, tactical principles to it. So it's not saying stretch speed's no good. Of course you want to stretch speed. Of course you want to have someone out there. Um, but when you're young, really young, uh, like when you're like nine, 10 years old, like you could stretch speed and it's not going to matter because the defenders who are defending you don't have the ability to match your speed. And so you just blow the doors off them and off you go. And then all of a sudden you, you know, two years later, you get to a spot where all of a sudden the defenseman can skate now and now they can match your speed. So now that stretch speed can be limiting because now you get to maximum speed. You start to, the other defenseman matches your speed and now you're easier to defend. Where if you were really tactical with your speed and understood speed differential, you could put the defenseman in awkward positions. So that's another really important aspect of tactical acceleration. Creating heels as a, as a tactical one-on-one uh, -on -one move is more valuable than net drive. When you're young, uh, you don't need to worry about too much because you blow the doors off people. So net drive is really, really important. If you're bigger than everybody else, much stronger than everyone else, you're kind of hit that, hit that growth spur before everyone else. Well then, yeah, net drive is going to be incredibly valuable to you. But net drive has tactical properties. It's not necessarily a thing you're going to be able to do all the time. So if you can create heels you're going to be able to really put yourself in a spot where, uh, you know, you can attack interior all of a sudden. There's, um, there's gap-oriented considerations that you're trying to focus on. You're reading a uh, defenseman stick. All those things come into play and are really important. So this is just considerations as it relates to tactical acceleration. And I bring all this up because this is, these are evaluating tools. These are, this is just one evaluating tool to take a look at someone's, a forward's ability to skate. But there's, there's, range, there's a sliding scale here. There's a range depending on the age of the kids. So for example, if all, all the kids were eight years old, well, straight stride skating, relentless work, stretch speed, and net drive, that would make, that'd give you a hell of a hockey player. Like that kid, could impact games positively, might actually score a ton of goals if they could really skate. But then fast forward three, four years, all of a sudden straight stride skating, relentless work, stretch speed and net drive, it's not as valuable as crossover skating, straight speed change, speed differential and creating heels. So we, as we're evaluating the player for what they're currently doing, we also have to keep in mind where we're trying to go, have a little bit of a vision where we're trying to go. That's where the development piece comes in. So even though we're starting with straight line skating, as everyone does, we are trying to also incorporate an ability to have crossover skating so that the, 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 uh, the, the sliding scale begins to tilt more in the favor of crossover skating because that's gonna be how we utilize some of these other tools. So these are important aspects as it relates to as it relates to evaluating. So let's take a look at a few of these things. So this is uh, this is uh, Larkin here, and what Larkin's going to do is he's going to have some tactical acceleration as he comes up through the middle of the ice. Part of the tactical acceleration is he's going to attack this defender's heel. So he comes on an on a diagonal to entice the defensive player to pivot and try to match him on this, on this, uh, on this angle. And Larkin's going to bait him into that position. And once he pivots, he's going to accelerate between these two checks. So let's watch it. Whoops. Sorry. Well, let's watch it. So that's attacking heels. That's an attack of heels skating between two checks. 
It's a use also of speed differential as the people who he's attacking are slowing down or stopped in the neutral zone in their neutral zone forecheck while Larkin is using space to build speed. He ends up with a differential and that creates the opportunity. Now he's able to get the offensive blue line off you go. So that's one of them. This is another one. So we're watching now Nathan McKinnon uh, here. So McKinnon obviously is tremendous, got great speed. So he's going to do a similar thing. So he gets a stretch pass. These guys are in their neutral zone forecheck. This guy here is the victim of, of what McKinnon's going to do. So he's standing still. So what happens is McKinnon reads that he's coming on a diagonal. That creates a heel. So he is going to attack his heels. That allows them to get the offensive zone. So that's tactical acceleration. That's what that is. So when we're grading players and we see kids that can really skate, they're great. What we would consider to be relative to the pool of players we're assessing, we're saying this kid's great skater. Uh, but does he do some of these other things? Or is he just looking to blow the doors off wide? Um, players who are inferior, what is his, exactly he's doing? So you have an evaluation. He makes the team because he's faster. So you can't say he's not making the team because he doesn't have tactical acceleration. Unless this evaluation is happening more towards the curve. If he's above the curve, then you just accept, yeah, he's got great skating. He's faster than everybody else. He can handle the puck. Seems like he's a reasonable kid. He's in. So now once he's in, we need to have a plan for him because he needs to be in going forward too. So that's why I'm mentioning this. So that's the whole McKinnon thing. So he's also speed differential and being able to create heels. This one's interesting here. So this is Druen. And the interesting part about Druen here is as he's attacking, he again, he finds a, a, a defender on an arc. And so he attacks the defender's heels. Now he comes up the middle. He's also got this defender who's folding back. And so now he's going to go after him and you can see him attack his heels, although it was further back. So this is a great use of space. So he uses his skating to create a heel to then create space for himself, which ultimately, as he attacks the middle, he pulls the 2D in, puts the puck to the outside. And now all of a sudden, 32 is a much better hockey player. He's a much better hockey player because he's got time and space and a defender and an awkward angle. That's because Druin was able to use his skating tactically to create opportunity for someone else. So those are that's an important fact. All right, so let's go back to where I left off here. So I was talking about the Druin situation. I don't know when I got kicked off. I don't know if it kicks me off instantly or whether there was a little bit of a lag. So I'll just do this Druin thing a little bit more now. So what we're talking about here is tactical acceleration and the use of skating to create advantage for other people, which is a great evaluation tool that we don't often talk about as it relates to skating. And so I want to make sure that we're using this as part of our ideas here. So um, so when Druin is attacking, he, he uh, creates opportunity by creating heels and he attacks those heels by and uses his differential. Then once he gets here, he's now has space between these two checks and by attacking the middle of the ice, accelerating through the middle of the ice, what he's effectively done is he's pulled this defenseman also to the middle, which then opens up opportunity for this, to, for this attacker. So that's a really important part. He makes him a potentially better player because of his, he's able to use, use tactical acceleration in a way in which uh, becomes more advantageous for his teammates. So not only is he a good player, but now he's, creating opportunity for other people. So as part of the development plan for a kid who can really skate would be, are you able to use your skating in such a way that it creates more opportunity for other people? Or do you only use your skating in a way that creates opportunity for you? And so this is as we're coaching kids and you know we've evaluated them and said, okay, he's a great skater, he's a four. But he's a four in what? And so this is sometimes like, I think the scale, and this is where I want to kind of, the Drew in clip is an important one. And it's important one as it relates to the relationship between, between evaluating him and, and development. So 
in our in our uh, in our rating scale, we say, okay, well, it's out of five, and you know, it's when you're coaching young kids, it's pretty easy to pick out who the good skaters are. Um, but what does that rating actually mean? Is the rating relative to the player that he's playing against, or is it relative to the skills we're expecting him to be able to express? So what I'm talking about here, as it relates to this Drew end clip, is I'm saying this is a high level play because he's using his skating to improve the opportunity for other people. That's a really high level opportunity. That might be reserved for someone who's like, you know, major, major peewee and up though, like that would be an expectation. But when you're younger, you know, you, they're more, they're more, uh, those kids are more, the speed is, is they're creating opportunity for themselves. Like once they get in the, once they get in see daylight, they're gone and they just go right straight to the net, which there's nothing wrong with that, but that's just a part of that develop that rating. But are we still rating players based on their ability to do that? Or are we rating players when they get older that they're skating? There's a different level of expectation for what those that skating should be. And should we assess them differently based on that? And if we are going to assess them because the game is going to change and evolve, then we also need to factor that into our development plans for the for the season, because it's difficult to put yourself in a spot where you say, hey, um, this kid's a good skater. He's a great straight line skater and he can blow the doors off people. But then all of a sudden you get to a certain age and all of a sudden that's not, that's not important. So he's actually not a good skater. He's fast, but he's not a good skater. There's a difference, right? And so I think as you're, as part of the evaluation process, one of the things I would challenge uh, you as, as if you were viewing this as an organization is to have your assessment tools also change in the criteria of what you think is important and how you would rate a player differently based on the age and the level and the expectations of what that is. And so I don't always see that. You see these, you know, hey, rate the player as to whether they're a good skater. And again, it's relative to the pool. So that's simple. What we want to do is say, well, we also need it to be something where, you know, he, it's got to be relative to the pool, but also relative to what we want him to be able to do. So I think that that's really important. So I have way too much video here for this, but I'm gonna just keep going on this because I think it's important and we'll get to the next piece. So that's the Drew end piece. And I think that was really important. This is the next one here. So this is now, this is a Pasternak video. So it's very similar, right? So he has on a exit, uh, he's, he's skating. He sees he's got Ogposo here, who's gonna track him. Uh, and now he's going to recognize that Ocposto has only got a stick. So he's going to skate through the stick. So in this situation, he's attacking his heels, but he's doing it very close to the body of Ocposto. Like he's, he's no longer trying to get separation. He's actually seeking and going into the traffic. So in this situation, when we watch, it would be very easy for for Pasternak to just go this way and try to out sprint Ocposo, who's trying to pick a line as to where he would think that he could get him. And instead of accepting that line and trying to see if he could just out skate Ocposo, he is going to go at him and he attacks his heels for the purpose of twisting him around in a knot so that the opportunity for the next player to get the puck is significant. And now you can see that player benefits from the time and space. So it's a really important, those are, that's another really important thing. So uh, now we have a kid who can skate. So we've talked about this kid. He started off, he's like, whatever, six, seven, eight years old. And all he did was he got the puck. He's a sprinter. He could blow the doors off people. Off he went in space. He was unbelievable. 50 goals, put it on the board. That was great. Then he gets to another level. And now the kids, the defensemen start getting better. And so now it's a little bit harder. So now he's got to think about like, maybe he should slow up in the neutral zone to create a speed differential, see if he can get the defenseman to slow down. Maybe he would benefit from having speed coming underneath a stretch. So stretch people get in front of him, push the D back. Now he's coming underneath. The D are slowing down because the, 
the they have to respect the stretch speed, but he is the real uh, the real uh, threat. And so now he has a ridiculous amount of speed. And so now that's how he's going to create more opportunity. And then that works for a little while. And then all of a sudden, like the guys get bigger, faster, the game is quicker, the space on the ice gets a lot less. So now you have to be a great skater and be able to accelerate, change speeds, attack heels, all that stuff. You have to do that in traffic. So as you're, as you're evaluating these players with each year that goes by and each level that they move up, the demands of what that tactical acceleration actually means, it evolves. And so from your perspective, I would say like maybe it's as simple as novice, Adam, Peewee, Bantam, Midget, each of those two-year increments, that's a new level of assessment. And so for two years, we're going to evaluate them the same way. Then when they move to the next level, there's going to be different ways in which we're going to assess. That is, I think, something that's interesting. I don't know how much time is spent on that. So that's why I raised the question. So that one's an important one. And then I'm going to just show one more here. So this is the next one. So this is... Uh, a true speed differential situation. This is Ocposo here. He's going to do what we call a dip excel. So a dip excel is a situation in which he's coming back to the puck and he's going to dip and come under. Actually, Bork did the same thing. He did a dip excel and now he's going to get ahead of Ocposo and Ocposo is going to slide into space underneath. So he's now building speed on the arc. He's going to get the puck and what's the value of all this? He's going to use... You're going to use this player as a stretch. He's going to use this space as his runway. And as he's attacking, you can see these defenders are now in a situation where they're really in an awkward spot. And then that allows him to be able to create a play on the entry. And then now he insulates himself, uses speed and tactical acceleration to insulate a pocket of attack space. And he uses the attack space to shoot. So... That's another way of using tactical accelerations, high level thinking, high level um, use of skating, use of speed. But when you, as you move up the levels, these are important aspects that we should be, we should be implementing. So is your, does your evaluation tool and the, the way in which you are, the, the, the criteria by which you are evaluating these players, does it match the demands of what that level is or should be? What, what are the demands? What do we want those players to learn when they get to that level? What are the demands? What are going to be important? What are the conditions of how that game is going to be played? Or frankly, how we want the game to be played? What is our philosophy as it relates to style of play, et cetera, et cetera? Those are all considerations to how you're going to evaluate. Then that evaluation tool should evolve as they move forward. You don't want to just say he's a four because a four four years ago and a four now are two totally different fours for me. So that's why it's important. So that's another, I think, really important consideration. So I think I've belabored the point here on tactical acceleration, although as you can see, I've, a, I've only reached halfway through the clips I, I wanted, but I like to be over-prepared. And if we have time, I'll come back and you, indulge a little bit more of this stuff. So uh, the next thing is, is that I think our challenge is, is that the desire to win now often outweighs the desire to invest in development. And what do I mean by investing in development? Well, if you're going to really invest in development, then you have to be willing to sacrifice things that are going to go on today for the benefit of what goes on tomorrow. So you, you might be, your kids might be more inclined to be able to skate really well in straight lines. And because they, frankly, they don't really get on their outside edges very much. And that's just a, 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 a function of leg strength and the way that they were taught and a thousand other reasons why they use more straight line skating. So if you were concerned about winning, you wouldn't really want to change that because your team plays really well and they play faster when they're in straight lines. However, we know that crossover acceleration is going to be important, but they don't really cross over very well. So we're not going to necessarily encourage them to cross over very well because you're definitely going to see a decline in their performance. 
uh, as they're trying to learn these new skills and the outside edge can be a little sketchy, they get really windy. So even though maybe they're faster in terms of how much speed they're generating, they might not be able to get from A to B too quickly because they aren't able to contain or control the line of the acceleration because every time they cross over, it's very curvilinear. So even though their speed is faster, they're actually playing slower from point A to point B. So in that case, you might be inclined to say, you know what? Yeah, this is probably not for us. Let's just leave them in straight lines because frankly, we're faster. Same with defensemen. You know, we all know that if any defenseman, when they get up to an, a certain age, when they start crossing their feet at the moment of, uh, at the moment of truth, if they, if the, uh, if the offensive player has any ability at all offensively and can read, um, read uh, sensitivities or exposures in defensemen, they're going to force him to cross his feet, cross, and then go the opposite direction. It's going to happen a million times. Now, all the way up, all the way up, um, there was opportunity probably to try to restrict that player in terms of their use of crossovers and get them more using ladder steps and kickbacks and all those other skills, but those are hard to teach. And I'm not a power skating coach, so I'm not teaching that. And then all of a sudden now we get to a level where we probably have to cut him because he crosses over too much and he gets victimized by kids who now are interested in manipulation. And so it wasn't so bad when everyone was coming in straight lines. Now we could just get up to speed, match the speed. And that was really the challenge. Now we get there and now I say, well, no, you, you, you weren't good enough to play before because you weren't good enough backward skater. So we told you, you got to be a back, better backward skater. So, okay. So now I go and I get my crossovers going. And so now I can cross my feet backwards. Okay. Yep. So now you can make the team this year because you're faster. Good news. Okay, good. So now I show up the next year. They said, well, you know what? Now you can't play now because the defense, the forwards are too, they got manipulation now. These guys are going to move you all over the place and they're going to tie your feet up in a knot. And so now you can't play anymore. So it's a, it's a moving target. The kid is always one step behind. He's not in anticipation of. And so I think that those are considerations. And this is another, another one where you got to figure out like how much is too much, uh, how much focus on, hey, we got to win tomorrow. How much is, is that important? It is important. Everyone wants to win. You got parents they are screaming at you. They all want to win. The kids themselves, they want to win. Of course, everyone's competitive and all that, all that jazz. It's great. Plus, you don't want to go to a tournament and lose four games and be home. Uh, you want to go and maximize your, you know, the money that you spent and the hotel rooms and all that great stuff. So winning is important. You can't say it's not. Uh, but, you know, we got to be careful because if we're too much on that side, then now we're not investing in development. And what does development mean? Well, development is a plan. Plan is based on what the what we are anticipating the needs are going to be going forward. And if we don't weigh that in and allow development time for that, then we're going to have a certain percentage of kids around the bubble, around that arc that are going to fall by the wayside. Minor hockey seasons are not stacked. Uh, we like to talk about it, but it, I don't know. I haven't seen too many. There's probably a few outliers, but for the most part, the seasons are not stacked. So what I mean by that is unless I'm coaching the team for three years and have a plan in which one year builds upon the next and the next year builds upon the next, unless I'm doing that, if you get a new coach every year, your seasons are not stacked because the coach that's getting you has no idea what we were taught last year. Frankly, if it's in my era, the coach might even walk in the dress room and tell you, hey, everything you learned last year, you can forget that because we're playing my way now. And so now it's like there's all this, you know, they're not stacked. There's a lot of incongruence. It's certainly not built in, in that way. And, and, and that is something that we have to consider as part of a challenge uh, because development is not only is it personal, but it, and not only is it a plan, but the plan usually is best when it's extrapolated over multiple years. And now we have a coach that's in there one year and then he's out and the next coach comes in. And it's unless unless you have a plan where there's like a succession plan where you have a coach 
and then the assistant coach takes over and then the other assistant coach takes over or you have some kind of succession plan or you have like a technical director who weaves everything together and sits you down with uh, at the end of the season and says okay you need to explain what you did to the next guy because this guy's taken over so you can tell him like what your philosophy was how we were working what we were doing maybe you have some videos show them so now the guy has a functional knowledge of what's going on well that never happens so the seasons are not stacked. They're individual seasons. One season has no relationship uh, over the other, unless you have something that is a congruent uh, situation where I'm the same coach or you get the same coach or you have these other considerations that have told you, I don't think really happen. So that's a major challenge. Teams who win are frankly viewed as teams who develop. So, Everyone wants to be on the team, the winning team, because we have the whole osmosis effect, right? So uh, development could be just being around better players. So I'm just going to get on the best team and I'm going to, I'm going to be with better players and I'm going to practice against them all the time. And Hey, this osmosis effect will take over and off we go. And there are situations in which that perfect storm happens and a kid is able to take advantage of that. But then there's also situations in which that's like the worst thing that happens. You have a player who makes a team that's a winning team, but they're actually, it's counterintuitive or counterproductive. The team plays too fast for them. Games move in a million miles an hour. They can't process it properly. And now they're actually regressing. And so, so the, the, you have to, like on a winning team, it works really well when you're in like the top six, the top four, you're the top goalie. Like it works really well in those situations. But when you're near the, like, if you're on the bubble to make the team the next year, like you're in the bottom three forwards, the last two D and the backup goalie, and you're trying to just figure out a way to survive to stay the next year, you it, it may be more of a problem for you. So uh, in terms of development, because you're just not at that level, and then you get boxed out or boxed in or, or boxed somewhere, and ultimately it can be, can be a problem. There are situations where it works. And there are situations where it doesn't work. So that's also another consideration. But, you know, uh, it's not necessarily the teams that are winning that are the, are the teams that are developing. You could be better in a team that's not necessarily winning all the game. They're a 500 team. But I get every opportunity to play in all situations. The coach is not looking to cut my ice. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, uh, cut my ice could be, I don't miss a shift, but the top line goes out, plays two minutes, and then my shift starts. I get out there for about 20 seconds. There's a whistle. I'm off. I mean, we have that too, right? So that stuff is going on, and that's, that is counterproductive to develop. It might be better for me, who I'm at near the bottom of this team. I go to another team, and they think I'm, again, Role, the role of me and how good I am is relative to the pool I'm in. So on this team, I'm near the bottom, but I go to the next team and I'm in the middle and I go to the bottom team and I'm at the top. And all of a sudden I'm just treated very differently. Those are factors in minor hockey that impact development and it impacts their uh, the way in which we assess them. So one thing that's where the relativity of it comes in because now I'm on, a, I'm on the top team in the league. I'm a third line center. And uh, I'm not even considered to be really that important. I'm really not that important. Um, I go to the, I leave that team. I go to a middle of pack team. They're like, you know what? This guy's pretty good. He can really help us. He's now the second line center on this team. And uh, like, we need him to kill penalties. Uh, he can play, play the power, but we probably need him to score a few goals. He can maybe facilitate for other people. Like we need this guy. And then I'm on the last place team. And all of a sudden, like, yeah, you're not maybe not the top top center, but like maybe you could play left wing for us on the top line. So all of a sudden, the whole thing is reversed. It's the same age group, it's the same league, but on three different teams, I'm at three different spots in the lineup, and that creates a relativity of my evaluation and my assessment. So is that really what assessment is? Is that really what we're doing? That's a consideration that I think that really needs to be talked about in your organization. Is how does that really impact our players, and can, how do we mitigate such uh, such discrepancies. I talked about osmosis and then uh, coaching capacity to influence team winning exceeds ability to develop sustainable skill. So this is very common. The coach's ability to influence winning. He can put the proper lines together. He can outsmart the other coach. He can play games with his 
uh, how, how, like who's on the ice when, and all that kind of jazz. He can do that. He can hide kids in the lineup, certain places like that ability. You can, you can influence winning uh, at certain levels, but that can exceed your ability when we're actually on the ice and you need to teach me to skate. You're like, mm, I don't really know much about skating. Yeah, I know, but you're teaching 10 year olds kind of important. So uh, like oftentimes that's a major challenge that you have a coach whose ability to influence winning is more, more than their ability to develop. Then you have the active and intentional suppression and de of development through ice utilization, which I just spoke about. And then you have the sliding scale of risk management versus attempts to execute new skill. They're disproportionate to development. So what I mean by that is don't turn the puck over at the offensive blue line. That's a rule on our team. Puck has, go, has to go deep. So now every player, except for a couple uh, that have a little more leash, uh, they don't understand how to play at that offensive blue line and make decisions based on spacing and based on ability to manipulate and ability to do different things. So that just takes, we take that right out of their hands uh, because of risk management. Like we just can't afford to have you turn pucks over. And every time we loosen the leash, you bite us because you turn the puck over. So that's no good. So you dump the puck in. We'll worry about the rest of it after. Um, and that is disproportionate to development because really we want them to fail forward. And what does that look like? And all of that jazz. So there is, there is a factors and challenges that are in minor hockey because of those, because of those things. Let's talk quickly about the achievement gap. So you have advantages, you have physical advantage, you have separation speed, which we've talked about extensively. Processing speed. Processing speed is usually related to skating speed um, in the sense that there are kids that because they skate just a little bit better than everyone else, the game actually kind of slows down a little bit for them. Now, there are kids that skate a million miles an hour and the game is like their, their brain doesn't is not able to catch up to their feet. So, of course, we have kids like that. But I'm saying in general, kids that are are good players for that league, like really good players for the league. Part of the reason is because they skate a little bit better and that helps them slow everything down. So that allows them to process things. And they usually have better athletic coordination at that time. Um, they just, they just got, they have, they can move their joints in order smoothly. Uh, they just have an ability to do those. They play maybe multiple sports, which is harder to do when you get older, et cetera. Challenges. Uh, could have a small frame. They just doesn't have that physical advantage. Could be really small. Could it be well behind as it relates to the maturity gap? You have all that. Separation speed. They actually don't have any. The, if the separation speed is other people separating from them. That's a challenge. Processing speed. Game's going a million miles an hour. They can't do it. Coordination. They grew six inches in three months. And now like they look like Bambi, they just really struggling with coordination or they have a real disconnect between their upper body coordination, their lower body coordination. Really good, really good like ping pong players, not so good at soccer. Uh, bridges. So these are things that you can do if you have some of these challenges. So one is, you know, body awareness. Like where am I going? What's my body position? How do I use body position to mitigate some of this? So if I'm a small player, and I'm concerned about, you know, being able to manage myself amongst the trees. Maybe I can learn how to cut people off and use body position more effectively. Uh, so bridges, these bridges are what you're going to teach these kids. Uh, speed differential. Hey, you're not the fastest kid, which is okay, because now we need speed differential. So you can actually survive if you understand speed behind the puck and if you understand how to put people where they can slow down while you're speeding up or you slow down while they're speeding up. Skating on touch. This is a big one. They can, they can catch a puck with their feet moving. They can pick up loose pucks with their feet moving. They can surround and protect the puck uh, on its first touch. Uh, so that's a really good bridge. Uh, Pre-touch awareness. Like they can, before they touch the puck, they shoulder check, they collect good information. They know where other people are. They know where their teammates are. They know where threats are. So they just make better decisions because they know more. They're collecting more information than other people. So if we have kids that are really struggling with processing speed, one of the tricks is to really have an emphasis on pre-touch awareness. What do you see? Hey, you, I shoulder checked. What did you see when you shoulder checked? Do you know what the threat was? Do you know the handedness of the guy that's coming to get you? Because that can impact your decision-making. So that's the achievement gap. We've got to be really cautious of this. 
and the achievement gap is a major factor as it relates to assessment. All right, and then blended skill. Blended skill is exactly what I was talking about. It's a coordinated thing. It's the ability to do two to two to three things at once. So the kid that can like catch and shoot, like there's three or four movements in there that are, have to be all blended together to look like one skill. Even though each of the individual skills, you can pull them apart. There's probably four or five skills that go into a catch and shoot. And individually, that kid can do it individually. But if you had to put them all together, it can be a problem. And it's just not smooth. The execution of it's not smooth. So blended skill is an important bridge. The bridge is the plan. So we have this kid's got all these advantages. This kid's got this disadvantage. These are things we're going to teach both sets of the kids to be able to, to function uh, more effectively on our team, not only today, but next year. All right, toe drag. So now we're going to get back to some clips. So toe drag, widely considered in minor hockey as an expiring skill that's used effectively at the younger age groups. Kid comes over, he's got a kid that's not very good skater going backwards. He's crossing his feet all over the place. Uh, and he's swinging his stick all over the place. He's probably not looking at the player's chest. He's looking at the puck the whole time. No, he's perfect victim for a kid that has good speed and a really good hands to be able to use this toe drag. And so he starts walking kids. He walks one, he feels really good. He walks two, now he's starting to get confidence. When he walks the third one, like he's basically doing it every game. Like he's toe dragging everybody. He's in the parking lot. He's toe dragging around the park cars. This guy is all in on the toe drag. That's what happens, right? We see it every year. This is what happens. So we are look at it. We're like, okay, toe drag's out because two years from now, someone's going to kill you. So you can't use a toe drag. Well, I don't know if you can't use it. You can't use it in the context in which you're using it, but it's not to say it's no good. So what we're going to go through with this toe drag is what's the relevant pieces of the toe drag that you should be keeping. And while you're trying to discourage this kid from getting killed in one, the defenseman stops looking at the puck and can skate and actually control body contact. And at the right time, when he catches this guy in a vulnerable position, which is the tables that have turned. So again, once it's a vulnerability, once contact comes in, in rush situation, it has expiring skill properties, which we talked about. However, the toe drag can be used in a lot of useful situations without vulnerability. So it's not something we should be saying it's out. We want to just evolve it and into other applications. So let's take a look. So as you can imagine, you can't tell a kid that the toe drag is no good and it can't be used because every day in the NHL, someone's using a toe drag. And so you can lose credibility amongst your group pretty quickly by saying, hey, you can't use it at all. It never used. When you get to that level, like this is a kid's skill, can't say it. Because all of a sudden you see stuff like this where you see Taylor Hall here, he's going to go in and he's going to use the toe drag to step past uh, the defender to generate a shot. Okay, so not a great, uh, not a well executed toe drag because of the vulnerability that he had with the defenseman to make it a little easier for him to be able to utilize it. But a kid who's like 10, 12 years old, he's not going to understand the nuances of when it's good, and when it's bad. That's where you come in. You say, hey, you got a sick toe drag. That's good. Let's start playing with it. Use it in different ways because you could use this multiple different ways. I don't want to take it off the table, but I also don't want it to be a vulnerability for you. So it's a good way to kind of frame it uh, to evolve it. But this is a good one to use because, like I said, it's a lot of coaches have a ton of disdain for such a skill. Like it, they, they literally lose sleep over it and it's a trigger for a lot of anger. Um, and so we got to try to evolve also with it. So this is a good example here. So we have Larkin. He's in this position here. What he's going to do is he's going to use the toe drag to open up a passing lane. So he's here. And now he's going to toe drag it around the defender. And then he's going to use, again, a hook pass. We toe dragged it both ways. He went into his body and then away from his body. And that's what created uh, the shot opportunity or the offensive advantage because he was able to do that. Next one is very, very similar. So this one's off the catch. So we're going to watch Marner here. This is a sick play. This comes from a guy who has gray hands. And he can toe drag a puck with the best of them. And this is an application of that. He catches the puck and inside the catch, 
uses the toe drag. So toe drag wasn't a bad skill here. It was really good. It made the whole play very smooth for him to be able to make this exit play. So we got to be careful about saying no, uh, can't use it at all, or this kid's going to get killed. So we preclude him when really that was an evaluation. I'm not saying it's a bad evaluation. It's probably a good evaluation. He has a limited use of, a, of this skill. It's overused, used at the wrong times. That's where you come in. That's where the development piece picks up. That's that space in between. So this is a great skill. Off the catch, into a pivot, onto the exit. Like, can't draw it better than that. It's really good. This is another one here, Matthews. So again, off the catch, watch him pull the puck all in one motion. So what's the value of this? Well, he's pulling the puck into his crossover so that it just makes him smoother on the exit. So he's using the puck as part of his skating. So here, pre-touch pre, pre uh, scan to see what's going on. Now he gets it. He knows that this guy's skating the opposite direction. So now he can, instead of catching it here and have that mess his feet up, he pulls it right into the crossover. So you'll notice he doesn't break stride here. Like this is, he uses the puck to help him with his skating, to lead him where he wants to go. And all of a sudden he's in the zone and uh, it ends up being a pretty good play. But that's use of a toe drag, but he's just doing it off the catch. So an important skill for sure. This is everybody's favorite, Zegris. This kid can play. He can play. He's a good hockey player, and he's got hands galore. We every 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 organization has a Zegris in their organization. A wonderful kid, unbelievable personality, constantly doing tricks and fun stuff. Everyone's got a kid like this. But sometimes they can do funny stuff that doesn't make a ton of sense, or they can get hit really hard because they put themselves in vulnerable positions. So it's up to you to say, hey, I love the creativity. I want you to do that. I want to encourage that. But let's find ways in which you can do it safely so you don't, we're not carrying you out in a stretcher. And you're creating a lot of value for not only yourself, but your teammates. So here's another one. Catch inside of pivot, go in the opposite way. Like, you can't tell me that's not a high-level play. What was the start of it? This whole spin all starts with a... Toe drag. He pulls the puck in the catch, into the turn, into the pivot. This is a ridiculous play, right? It's got a lot of real, really cool values um, and high, high level plays. He ends up creating scoring chances out of it. You could also argue that this was a toe drag. While he's here, as he's picking up this loose puck between the defender's legs, he's using a toe action, toe drag action. So that's another good way to maybe digging out a puck um, out of out of a pile. Uh, this one here. Uh, so this is uh, this is a Nylander catching the puck, and he does a toe drag to get around a stick to create opportunity. So again, off the catch. So this is a great catch, but he uses that's a, basically a toe drag. So that's what I wanted to illustrate. Is like. There's a lot of uses for this skill. I'm only picking three or four because I already learned my lesson of giving you three minutes of video for this. I knew that you didn't want that. I just wanted to illustrate the point and show a lot of different players, a lot of guys that got good hands, a lot of guys who probably came up being told, hey, that toe drag, that's going to get you killed. And you weren't wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. It is a vulnerability, but that's where evaluation and development marry, and you have to have a vision for where it is. Hey, toe drag today is great. You're dangling kids. You're walking to the net. Bob's your uncle. Everything's great. Now, when we next year or this year, let's work on catches and let's work on, you know, different applications for how you can use this skill. So you don't take it out of his hands. You, you help him evolve it, partner with the player to be able to do it. Um, where, where valuation and development intersect. So that's an important aspect of what we want to talk about is where do they, where do they kind of meet? And I've talked a lot about um, the meeting point is the space between, which is the plan or the development considerations that you're going to have for whatever the skill is, is where there is active and intentional coach training and development, there's going to be a very good 
intersection between evaluation and development. Because anytime there's intentional coach training and development, someone is sharing a vision for how they want the coach to operate, the types of skills in which they want to do. There's a collaboration of sorts in which there's a decisions are being made about the direction that this team and these players should be moving in. So that's going to help facilitate evaluation and development intersecting more consistently. Where the coach training is in step with the player's age, skill set, and development themes with the objective of the player preparation for the next level, that's also going to intersect evaluation and development. So if you have coach training and it's general, where it's like one stop shop for everybody, you have the guy coaching first year novice in the same room as the person coaching, you know, AAA, you know, midget. Uh, you know, you're now not coach training necessarily in step with the player's age, skill set, and development themes. You're creating generality. So you might be talking about, you know, team building and you're talking about, you know, uh, other considerations, cultural considerations of how to build, you know, parent interactions, all that kind of stuff. That's great. You can do all that stuff. Um, and talk about the different considerations at different age groups. But when it comes to actual player development, it's much harder to have everyone in the same room talking about uh, things in generalities. Now, it's not bad to have everyone in the same room because you're gonna have so much experience um, that you can be lent itself all the way through uh, your organization. It's just the topic of discussion should be specific to that age and skill set. So when they're talking about the midget coach says, hey, when kids get here to midget, one of the big problems we have is they don't pivot very well. Like I would really like someone at the lower age groups like Bantam and Pee Wee, even really young to invest in pivoting. So now you're talking about a topic of pivoting and then each of the age groups are, okay, well, what does pivot look like at novice then? Like, what does that look like? What does it look like in peewee and bantam? Like, can we use a crossover pivot? Do we use mohawk? Do we use this? How, does, how do we do it? The kids right now are using both feet when they turn. Should they be one foot or the other? If so, when? Like all these considerations are great talking points that you can have that will help evaluation and development intersect. Where there's evidence of development themes in practice. So evaluation and development will intersect where there's a development theme. Development theme means when you go on the ice and you run your first drill, when, you, when the second drill starts, I can see evidence of the first drill in the second drill. And then when you do the third drill, I can see evidence of the first drill and the second drill showing up now in the third drill. So it's a, it's a building and there's a theme and I'm seeing kind of similar properties that are going through stitched through the whole practice. That's an evaluation. You've, you've, you've picked a theme. That means you had an evaluation. You said, Hey, we suck at this. So whatever that this is, that's your theme. And that was an evaluation. And now you're going to intersect development by saying, we're no good at it. So now we're going to try to influence it. So where there's evidence of a development theme in a practice, I'm starting to think, okay, these guys are starting to understand the how this evaluation and development can intersect, if not two separate things. Where all players are encouraged to make all plays in all areas of the ice. Yeah, I said it. I know I'm not supposed to say it, but I said it. If you're encouraging every kid, ninth forward, the guy who shows up every so often, he's like clouds in the sky. He's not really paying attention. He has the same rope as the guy who's dialed. He wants to play. He's so excited to be at the rink. He's not a, he's, he, he's a, a really impactful player on your team. Yeah, they have the same rope. If they all have the same rope and you're encouraging them and you're coaching them through, well, then, yes, evaluation and development will intersect because your encouragement towards that playmaking is going to be different or personalized between the two. So that's the difference. The difference in the intersect is the personal nature, uh, the personalized nature of how those kids make those plays in those situations. And then where no one player's opportunity to learn is greater than the other. If, you, if we have that, we probably have a good intersection between evaluation 
and development. We're providing equal opportunity for players to apply whatever it is that they learn based on our evaluation of how we decided about amongst what it was that we wanted to teach. Well, that's where it starts to intersect and we start to see more of these things. And if I'm coming around and I'm watching, if I can see any of these, I'm going to be encouraged. Uh, puck protection. I'm going to go one more here and then I imagine that you guys have better things to do. So I'll answer some questions um, and then we can get out of here. Shield protection is a baseline skill of protection. It's not the objective. You don't want to have your back to the puck. A skill, it's part of it. It's a foundational piece, but it's not the objective. The objective is puck of puck protection is to move through the protection into the space to make a play. So you only want to be in protection long enough to be able to buy yourself either time, space, uh, time for other support, uh, to manipulate the, the defensive player, to open up the opportunities to be able to make a play. But protection, puck protection, is actually uh, a kid who's very good at shielding the body uh, with puck protection. That's not the objective. I actually want to see a player in puck protection come out of it and make a play. If there's no plays happening and they're just protecting the puck and then it's like uh, they protect the puck and then they put the puck into a 50-50, he's not good at puck protection. He's good at shielding, not so good at puck protection because puck protection implies you're protecting it to then make the next play. That's an important distinction as it relates to your evaluation process. Looking to add puck protection skills with sh shielding the puck protection, base, the, those baseline properties, adding layers is really, really important. So let's take a look at a couple of these. So this is McKinnon we're watching here. Oops, sorry. This is McKinnon we're watching here. McKinnon's going to basically go into beast mode. So this is your, this is your guy who's, uh, he's 14 years old. He's literally on the backside of puberty at this point. And you have other kids who haven't even like started and that's probably not even coming for another two years. They're going to be, they're going to be another year or so before it even starts. So there's a wide disparity of strength, physical ability, size, the whole nine yards. So this is McKinnon in this example, you'll see what I mean. So he's going to get the puck here and he's going to go through these two guys. He's willing to bump in. He's pushing people off. He's knocking people over. He's like, be, total beast mode. He's knocking people around. Guy's unbelievable. So everyone's happy because, man, look how physical this guy is. And you know what? He did a great job protecting the puck. Everything was great. So what we want to make sure we do is we marry that for that particular player and also add all the other little skills that are really important as well. So I'll go through some of those here in a second. So this is another one. So this is Kalorn here. He sees Wilson coming. And so in part of his protection, he's going to use a little back hit. Everyone loves a back hit. Everyone loves it. It's really impressive. But what's the problem? Great hit on Wilson, uh, but no, wasn't able to control the puck. So great hit, great initial puck protection to protect himself because Wilson obviously was coming to hit him. So he was looking to protect himself. No puck protection, though. We didn't make, we weren't able to make the play. You could argue, argue Lars Eller was good in puck protection there. Or better in puck protection. Next one here you're going to see is a seal. So this one is uh, this one here is Felino. So Felino is going to come out of his jump, and now he's going to seal. And so he's protecting the puck. He never touches him, but he positions himself. So now his shoulders are facing perpendicular to the wall, which means now his vision has expanded. So his ability now to be able to open up and find other places greatly enhanced that's what i mean about puck protection that's a, a big factor let me do one more clip let's see here yeah this is another one so this is going to be uh ranting and pre-touch he already he's already in puck protection right now he didn't touch the puck yet so high level puck protection is a pre-touch pre-contact builds a wall rotates around it he's already done all his protection he hasn't touched the puck puck yet very good job, allows him to make the play. He's also, again, perpendicular to the wall with his shoulders, so now he can see the whole rink. At the time in which 
he was not perpendicular to the rink and he was controlling the puck like here, he wasn't touching it. He was surrounding the puck as part of the puck protection, but he never touched it. He was waiting to be able to get to this side. Now, of course, he's looking to see what his options are and he makes his decision. This is puck protection too. This is Kane. He has a speed differential and he uses the space between the defender's stick and their skates. He puts the puck there and hides it. That's also puck protection. This is another one. This is Corey Perry. And you can see him also going under sticks and passing under sticks. That's also puck protection. Very important skill. If you want to play at a high level, you need to be able to make plays inside of high levels of traffic. So here's another one. Look at Rantanen here. Through the sticks, under sticks. Very important, important skill. That toe drag we were talking about, very important in this kind of, this kind of stuff. We call it little touches. Getting the puck past the stick and in between the stick and the skates of the defender, that's a hidden area that you can protect the puck. That's also puck protection. When we teach in that, who we teach in that to, where does that fit in our spectrum? And it's an important aspect. Last thing I want to talk about is the D. I haven't talked much about the D, so I'm going to talk about the D. Well, if you follow me at all, you're going to know that I don't love the point shot. It's not one of my favorite things, especially as it relates to player development. It can be really precluding. So point shots are one way for the D to contribute to offense, but they are not the only way. Majority of goals are actually scored at middle distance or closer. So there's a time in which the D aren't even strong enough to be shooting from the point. So why we even bother them with that? Why not help them understand how to use other skills? So add principles of attack as guidelines so they can understand how to activate in the offensive zone. They can do it with movement off the puck. They can do it with downhill shot threats. They can also create seams for interior passes. So here is a good look at some of these particular skills. So you're gonna see here, this is Susie. And he's going to activate. Once it gets to the high three on two, he activates, he gets going downhill, and he ends up finding his way to the net. So it's an activation. And the D is looking at middle distance. Here he's inside the top of the circle when he releases the puck. That's middle distance. And then when he actually scores, he's at the net. So he's in the areas in which goals are being scored. Sometimes we can be precluding for defensemen their offensive ability by demanding too many point shots and having a low to high game as a feature part of our thing. It can be precluding to player development. Maybe be better for winning, but not so good for player development. Here is a similar idea. Uyghur is going to attack. He goes downhill. Now he's well inside the dots. He's able to get in and start creating and generating chances. So at what age could we be doing this? Maybe we could be doing this at a younger age group to really encourage them to be looking. Here's a play here. We're going to see Peter Angelo. He jumps down. He attacks that space, finds the other guy who's now also coming down, and now it becomes really dangerous. So just finding these situations, when can you teach this? Could you have a section in which offensive, the offensive zone, like this type of movement, all of a sudden is something that you guys care about because you want, you want to encourage these players to look into middle distance as they're playing. So both Colorado D are really active and both of them end up in the same sequence, uh, although not at the same time as attacking uh, middle distance and getting into space. So uh, evaluating a kid at eight years old or nine years old for his strength of his shot um, and then telling him, okay, because he has that shot, let's teach him point shot may not be as best use of time. Maybe that's a skill that we keep in the can for him. Uh, he, we continue to work on a point shot because it's not to say that you're never going to use it, but at certain times in their development, it's actually restrictive to other, other levels of player development. Those should be things that we should be considering. So there you have it. Translatable skills. These are translatable skills. Common challenges. Straight line skating can be a problem. It has limitations. Backwards crossovers has limitations. Not saying they're bad skills, saying they have limitations. Have to, they have to evolve. Singular skill expressions, doing one thing at a time, big problem. Not being able to do things with your feet moving, big problem. One-on-one, -on -one, excessive one-on-one -on -one can be a problem. Has advantages we want to encourage. 
got to be careful. Sometimes it's not just one-on-one -on -one so you can go score. Could be one-on-one -on -one so that now you can create a two-on-one. -on -one. Movement after the play. If there's no movement after the play, we got problems. We need to have movement after the play. What are you doing next? Why are you doing that? Where are you going? Why are you going there? On stick shooting. As the higher level you go, the more, the longer the puck is on your stick before you shoot it, the more the advantage is to the goalie. And then skills that take advantage of the competition that hasn't caught up yet. So toe drag, we talked about, net drive, we talked about, and back shield puck protection. These are three common. They're not the only ones. They're just three common. And then these are translations. So outside edge development, especially for crossovers, turning, change of direction, curve linear skating, linear crossover, evasive skating under pressure, collecting information pre-touch. That's an important one. Blended skill expressions, which we talked about. There's a gazillion blended skill expressions that are important to go through. One-on-one -on -one to create two-on-one -on -one and purposeful movement after the puck. Those are easy, everyday uh, skill translations. There's thousands of them. I just listed ones that could be good talking points for you. That is my kind of section here for the for the um, for the for the uh, for the presentation. I would like to open it up to anybody that has any questions. I think we've been grabbing some of these. Do you do you have these, or do you want to read out the ones that you want to talk to me about, or what do you want to do? We can also have people like they can. They can verbalize it too if they don't want to text it. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure. A webinar, I think I can allow them to talk. Uh, I think you can, yeah, you can let them talk. It's usually easier. I, I find it easier. Um, Holy geez, some of these questions are not soup questions. Ooh. <laughs> that one's loaded. I think that one's... That one's a loaded one. I got to be careful with that one. Um, you often return ancillary skills deficient. All right. So if you can, if you can, I think it's better if you let them talk. I, I got to, I don't know if I can do that on a webinar. I can know I can do it on, on a meeting, but. Uh, all right, let me, let me, we got a few. I can go through these here. I'll just yeah. go through them. I'll just go through them. Okay. Um, so let's see here. How let's go with this one. Is it better to play in all situations or, or practice with better players? What does the research show? I, I don't know. I haven't done any research on it. Um, I don't know that there's very good research on such a uh, thing. I think that it comes down to, I think I would, I'm going to come at it from more of a, what I would consider to be common sense. And the truth of the matter is a little of both. You, you want to, you have to play in all situations. I mean, you need to be able, you need to be able to be, a, you, you, you got to play on a team in which you're valued. It's so the worst place to be on a hockey team is where you are unimportant. And I think that, you've got to avoid that as much as you can. It's better to play at a lower level or a lower team and have the puck at certain age groups. Now at some age groups, like when you get older, you definitely want to be on better teams. Of course you do, because that's where, that's what you're trying to do. But when you're younger, um, it's very delicate. You don't want to be caught in situations where you're not getting in all these situations because it's not so much the situation that is the importance. It's the it's the it's the impact on the player and how they feel about their self esteem. Like, there's nothing worse than a kid. It's a power play, and he's next to go out. He or she is next to go out, and then the coach like shuffles them down. Like the impact that's the impact that that has on that player is too much at certain at certain age groups. It's really tough. Um, so for me. I want player in all situations. Is it better to play with better players? Of course it is. Of course it is. Yeah, it's always better to play with better players, except when the you can't get on the ice or you can't get in those situations, then you're not really playing with better players. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, what are your thoughts on, here, let me just grab this question. 
what are your thoughts on how to go forward uh, from having uh, that question's loaded? I got to stay away from that one. That one's to do with it was it's to do with um, like building a kid's confidence up after you've had a really bad coach. And that is not a soup question. It's one that I would probably have to be here for quite a bit longer to really give you a fair question. Might have to have you send me an email so I can properly respond. Uh, let's see this one. You often refer to ancillary skills and how a deficiency in them can prevent skill development elsewhere in a player. What are the most commonly leveraged ancillary skills that coaches should be focused on? Great question. The most uh, lacking or co most commonly lacking ancillary skill is outside edge. And the separation of upper body and lower body, the ability to upper, separate the upper body from the lower body. And the other one is to have a puck range, a common, a, a comfortable puck range, puck handling range that's outside the dead middle of the body. Those are the three really precluding ones that are really tough to overcome. And the older you get, the more problematic that those can be. So outside edge all day long, as much as possible. Um, in, in crossovers, change of direction, all of that is critical uh, because you, you, it's so, so limiting in terms of skill acquisition if you don't have that. And then the ability to separate upper body, lower body is such a problem for most young players. So those two uh, definitely for sure right at the top of my list. Do you have um, a, like a drop dead age on that, Daryl? What, what do you think? What's the age when it's almost impossible to teach? There is none. The age itself, the age itself is not really precluding. The issue is um, you can always impact the players, it always it can always impact the player. The, the issue usually is comes down to the, the motivation of the athlete and the skill set of the instructor are the mo are more limiting than the age. Uh, you get a, someone who knows what they're doing and you have a kid who really wants to learn and impact, you can do a lot of really cool things with a kid in a very short period of time. But oftentimes the limitations is us. We just don't know enough. The player's needs far exceed our ability to teach. So that is really, I think, most, most problematic. Obviously, hockey is a sport that's best. These skills are best taught younger. Like you don't want to, you want to be a kid that's really crossing their feet when you're young because it's going to make a huge difference in your ability to stop, turn, all that stuff. Because the more you're on that outside edge, the better it is. So that's a, another good question. You've worked one-on-one, -on -one, small groups, full teams, camps. What do you think the best or most conducive format for players to learn? What's your favorite? Um, I prefer being on the ice if it's going to be a player development session i don't really like to be in on the ice for more than 10 or 12 kids i if it's kids i really don't like it um because it's uh, again development is personal so in my business i'm in development i need to be able to watch what you're doing and you know create an ex a verbal exchange of uh you know after reps and have you be able to talk to me and if there's more kids out there the problem is is now i can't get a personal exchange with you it's not personal i'm just running drills i'm not really talking to you so if you have help sometimes you can get more because then you can get that personal touch but you always have to remember there's a big difference between coaching and teaching coaching is group teaching and development is individual it's very very small so that's why If time for uh, a couple more, or do you want to get going? Yeah, no, more? no, let's do let's do a couple more. So, how yeah. do you tell how do you tell players they are not Connor McDavid or Sidney Crosby, and tell them to be who they are, but with those individual skills? Yeah, you know, like I I, I struggle with this because I I definitely understand, um, you know, kids like ex, you know going so far outside their skill set that it's almost ridiculous and it has low probability of success and can be frustrating to the teammates as well as coaches. I get that. 
And so there, the balance between that is to have incremental improvements. So you want to be able to say, I understand where you want to go. I understand what you're trying to do. Here's a path to get there. We'll get you there in some of these skills that we want to do. But here's ways to stack the deck in your favor for those skills, whatever the skill might be. So, you know, you don't, I don't, I would never say to a kid, okay, like, you know, here's the truth of the matter. Truth of the matter is, is like, you're just not very good. And you're not going to become, you're not going to have these dangly skills. You don't have the skill set. The puck comes back to me basically square every time you touch it. And so you're probably not a puck handler. Probably not going to go down that path. I'm going to say, if you want to handle a puck, here's situations where you can handle a puck to make a play. That's what we want to be able to do. Handle a puck to make a play. And so if you can evade a stick and make a play, or you can slip a puck underneath, like those are the types of things we want to start with and then gradually build them up from there. I'm not touching the teaching aids because everyone knows my thoughts on that. It's probably not, probably not smart for me to go on that path. Um, let's see. Let's see, uh, pick a good one here. Okay, this is a good one, specific. I wanna focus on backward skating. How do I make, how do I make a fun practice for you, you 11 girls that focuses on backward skating? I have and can teach power skating, but I wanna make it fun. Okay, so this is right up my alley. So. What you have to do is stitch backward skating into everything that you're going to do in that practice. You can start off intentional because you want to give them like maybe some keys or cues or whatever. So you have maybe one drill that like takes them through a couple of the key points. After that, you're going to gradually hide backward skating in other things. They're going to do something else then they're backward skating or they start with backward skating, they go and do something else. And then they're back to the backward skating as part of the drills. And then gradually you're going to put them in situations where you gradually make it more game situation. And then you talk about backward skating. So one of the things you might do is you might have a constraint on a game. Maybe you do like a two on two game where you say, Hey, uh, uh, the, every time you're the puck carrier, you need to pivot and skate backwards with the puck at least a couple of steps before you make a play. Then the next kid gets it, pivot, backwards skate, makes a pass. And then you have some kind of some type of that's one of the constraints that leads you down a path to game to make it fun. It's all in the the fun is in the application and the hidden components of what it is that you're doing. So you can be intentional. You got to be careful. Like no one wants to do power skating for 60 minutes. They just don't want to do it. Especially if it's a team, they just don't want to do it. But you can do skating and have skating as your focus for literally 10 practices in a row, and they wouldn't even know it, that you were really intentional with your skating. If you're creative in how you work the drill design and you're not too just dead set on being too technical and you're going to be willing to allow this to be a little bit longer process, I think that that's where it can become a little more fun. Um, we'll do one more. Um, do your evaluation strategies change when projecting talent in two to three years from now? If so, what do you believe are projectable characteristics to look for? Most projectable characteristic of someone who's like, if you're recruiting in junior A, so now you're looking, I'm assuming you're looking at Bantam, Midget, kids. The most projectable is they have a baseline of skill that is above, slightly above the level in which they're playing and yet show a high level of learning capacity. So that means if I come and watch you on October 10th, and then I come again and watch you on December the 10th, are you the exact same player or is there something new that you've added to your game? If there's nothing new and you kind of look the same, then that it reduces my excitement towards you. I want to, when I'm projecting, I want to see kids that are continually improving, that's an important aspect. And that can be coach driven from the people that are around them. Uh, and then that can also be driven by the player that they're looking to add or 
add new favorites. The other thing that I, you want to see in kids is that they can create competitive advantage. If they can't create competitive advantage, then that's, that's going to be a problem from, from a projection perspective. And what I mean by competitive advantage is, is that they can, they can create something that creates an advantage for our team, not necessarily them individually, but our team. So can they use their skating to be able to make a play for someone else? If they can do that, I'm starting to get excited. If they only use their skating when it's their puck, which happens a lot, like they're, they, they want to net drive and they want to just, if they, they can only do it in, in space, I'm not as excited. So learning capacity and creating competitive advantage would be the two things at the top of my list. What do you think? You think that's a good place to stop? Yeah, that's good. All right. Yeah. That was fun. That was fun. Excellent. I'm, hope I'm hopeful that that was something that you, uh, that you were looking for as it related to the relationship between, um, between, you know, trying to find a way to, to be a good, like in your evaluation of players, but then also have player development in mind because that's really your business. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what we're really looking for. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect and just wanted to start the dialogue with it. And who knows, maybe we can build on this and expand it at some point. And anybody that's listening, we're, we're really trying to cater to coaches, parents, evaluators, associations, and just bring on different ideas like this. So please circle back with me and throw any ideas around and we'll, consider, we'll continue to try new things here. And and uh, keep working towards being better as a province. So, so yeah, thanks everybody for attending, taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, I think Daryl mentioned we may be able to steal this presentation and put it on our on our YouTube channel if he agrees to that. So within a few days, possibly it might be up for everybody to review. And so if that does happen, please share the link with coaches. I know there was a whole bunch of people that messaged that couldn't make it tonight due to conflicts, but want to see the presentation and make sure if this if this this uh, information resonates with you go buy Daryl's book like we just honestly scratched the surface here tonight there's a wealth of information in that book to to help you as a coach parent uh, association evaluator whatever your role is in hockey so um, that's a way we can thank Daryl for coming on and and spending his time with us tonight so yeah if that's all there is um, Thanks a lot, Daryl. Really appreciate it. It was excellent. Awesome. My pleasure. Have a great night, everybody. Yeah.